God. Our next guest is the last living member of the trio that John Romano credits for revolutionizing the muscle building equipment industry, along with Joe Gold and Arthur Jones. Tom Kinney's contributions to the industry are many that you take for granted even today. Uh, from something as simple as the selectorized weight stack and rotating handles to the common jungle gym, it's all Tom Kinney, and it's my distinct honor to welcome him to the show. Welcome, Tom. What's up, Dave? How's it going? Hey, you know, uh, we've been trying to get a hold of you for a while, and uh, John found you. And, uh, you know, a couple of things that strike me as really interesting is, when you know, when I introduced you, Tom, you know, I mean, John actually, you know, had told me that, you know, b- between you, Joe Gold, and Arthur Jones, uh, you know, there would be no weightlifting equipment today. Uh, h- how did you actually get started in doing this whole thing? Well, we were, you know, living in the Bronx, and body, this was in the 70s, bodybuilding. The only thing around was working out in someone's basement. There were no really bodybuilding gyms that I've, especially in the East Coast. And we would live off Joe Weider's magazine that probably only came out in four or five times a year back then. And of course, Joe uh, Joe Weider was great at picking cover shots. Um, you know, we would wait, and everything was the cover shot. If, if it was Arnold or, or Dave Draper, sure, or maybe Rick Wayne. Um, you know, these guys had great arms, and um, we would just, um, you know, there was really no equipment to buy. We didn't have any money, so we would end up making the equipment ourselves. Well, you you made some quite a bit of equipment, and, and uh, it ultimately led to your company, TK Star, which I think everyone uh, is aware of and knows of. I mean, I remember going into my very first Bally's Jack Lane back in the day, and it was all TK uh-huh. Star. How, how did how did you start the company? I started the company when I would say, let me think. I I ran in there. There, there was we. We were home. We were watching. We, we you know, of course, we never went to school. So we go walk <laughs> Who, around like who's Times we? Square. Tom, who's we? Me, me, and my friends. You know. Okay. And um, it was this was 1976. We saw a show on TV that Arnold and Frank Zane and a guy named George Butler was. They were going to do a, a art exhibition at the Whitney Museum. Right. And we were all excited, so we made our way down there. We got into that, you know, exhibition. And um, that's when I met Wayne D'Amelia and uh, his wife back then, and her name was Karen. And uh, we just kept in touch. And out of the blue sky, I just told them, oh, yeah, I make gym equipment. And they said, wow, you make gym equipment. No one makes gym equipment. You know, you, you should keep in touch with us. So we did. They lived in Long Island at the time so we, that's when Wayne Demilio wasn't even running shows he was trying to run his first show right which I guess was Night of Champions in 1978 sure so that started exposing me to the bodybuilders and uh, you know the whole bodybuilding world and all it did was energize me to you know make equipment and uh I don't know if you remember a guy named George Schneider. Sure. He had yeah he had shows in Pennsylvania, and um, he had a couple guys trying you know like he actually had a plumber make some equipment out of pipe, <laughs> and you know everything was just in the beginning stages of his bodybuilding, and of course any kind of uh, things to go along with it as far as equipment goes. So you made this stuff by hand then, huh? In your oh, house? Oh yeah. And what? Yeah, we- we made it by hand, and then I started learning welding. I, I just started getting welding jobs. I used to walk down by the Hudson River where there was a lot of factories, and I would just go from one job to another. You know, I would just start out as, a, you know, the lowest guy in the shop, like grinding steel. But my whole goal was just to learn how to weld or make work with steel. So I could, you know, really, my whole, my whole goal was to make gym equipment. Tom, how, how did you determine, you know, from a mechanical standpoint, how you would sort of emulate the body's movements and, you know, relate that to um, how a machine would work? To be honest with you, man, I, I thought about gym equipment day and night. I would just daydream about it, constantly thinking of 
um, it just kind of came out of me. I just, I just never stopped thinking about it. Twenty four seven. So would you would you like watch a, uh, like a guy do a curl or something and see how that would sort of relate to a mechanical movement on in, in a piece of machinery? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, like I told um, John the other day, me like when I used to go visit Joe Gold, we used to sit there in the gym and watch guys work out. And Joe, I think Joe said to me that a bodybuilder is like a rat. Looking for a piece of cheese. <laughs> like, if you just keep watching him, he's trying to do a movement. You know, he's trying to get in a position or he's trying to bend down to do triceps. And he does it by, a bodybuilder does it by instincts. So we were just constantly, I mean, that's probably how Joe Gold made a lot of good, invent, you know, in, innovations. Because he actually, he sat there and watched, like, the best bodybuilders in the world all day long. Right now, now um, I, I met Joe Gold when he was a you know an older man. I didn't meet him till he was you know until the early eighties when he was uh-huh. a pretty cantankerous and cranky old guy. Um, I, I, he was always like that. Oh, I, was, I was just going to ask you what he, what was he like that when he was younger too? Uh, he was well, you know he yeah he ever since I've known him. Well, I mean I met him. I guess first time I met him was in nineteen seventy seven. He opened up the World Gym. And um, he was just always very, you know, that's just how he was. So what, 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 how did you meet him? How would you actually, uh, you know, because he was, he was uh, a West Coast guy. You were on the East Coast. How did you guys hook up? Originally in 1977, I, of course, I was in New York. And um, I just got, a, I just took, a, I just took off from New York and I got, I made my way out to California. And I thought I wanted to be out in California. I stayed a summer there. And I remember watching Roger Callard on the beach. And, you know, it was like uh, Venice Beach. Right. And that was the old Muscle Beach, I guess they called it. And um, I, I was at that gym every day. And then Joe Gold, you know, said to me, like, you know, why do you, you know, who the hell are you? Why did you come here? <laughs> and uh, I told him I want to make equipment. I'm make, I, actually, I told him I'm making my own gym back in New York. And I came out here to check out the equipment. And then, you know, he was, um, he was nice to me after that. You guys had something and in common. Then, That's why, yeah. And then Zabo was there and Eddie Giuliani was there. They were kind of like, and they just, you know, hung around all day. Yeah. Uh, hung around with lifting weights and laying in the sun, right? Yeah. Those, yep. are, those were the days. Yep. Yep. Now, now when did you, uh, you met Arthur Jones too, didn't you? I met Arthur, well, first time I actually met him and sat down was like 2003. Now, Arthur, oh, wow. Arthur Jones created Nautilus, just so that people know right. who we're yeah. talking about. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the first time I saw Arthur was in 1976. 1978 or 79, there was a big trade show down in, around, I think it was in Philadelphia. And he, the only thing I remember is he had a film crew following him all over the place. They they filmed every part of him. And uh, there was a, it was a big thing when he showed up at the trade show. Because hmm. at the time, he owned like the whole market back then. There was only Nautilus, only, right? There was no other? Only you, yeah. You, you you couldn't open a gym or anything without Nautilus. There was no such thing except Nautilus. Was he a rich man because of that? Yeah, he made a lot of money. I mean, he spent a lot of money. He probably <laughs> spent it all. <laughs> what did he spend it on? Oh, he had a big taste for um, airplanes. Oh, really? Oh, like, uh, real airplanes? Oh, yeah. Real airplanes. He, yeah, and he, had, um, you know, he did a lot of research. He was a very scientific guy. Yeah, he, he he conducted studies and, and everything. He's really into the science part of it, and he had a saying that, you know, he, he, he had a good education. He just didn't get it from college. Gotcha. But um, he was smart in his own way. Did, did Arthur but Jones I, sell Nautilus at some point, or did he did he die with it, you know, and then no, give he, his sold, he sold it. No, he sold it. Actually, his son, Gary was working in the Texas plant and that's when they started developing the plate loading Nautilus line the, the hammer machines it, right the ha- it became hammer right right 
I didn't and know that. Gary, Gary saw the handwriting on the wall because at the time, Cybex was coming up. Because Cybex, when they came out, they were much smoother. And they were much smaller. The machines. Yeah. And um, I don't know, I guess Arthur saw... You know, Arthur had a thing that kind of backfired on him for a long time. He was against the barbell, you know, with the gravity. And that was his whole story with the cam, saying that the cam gives you complete resistance to the whole movement. And at the time, in the especially 70s, no one knew anything about anything as far as working <laughs> out. They didn't know what worked, what didn't work. And they, they, they swallowed Nautilus hook, line, and sinker. And, and Arnold was a, um, I'm sorry, Arthur was a good salesman. Yeah, he made everyone think they needed it, huh? Oh, he was a, he was a real showman. And, um, but people started catching on and then he jumped at it. I'm not saying that was a bad thing he did, but, you know, he, he just, uh, I think he had a, got a good offer on, on, uh, the sales, kind of like, a lot of competition was coming in now. Right this on. was like 1982. Mm -hmm. And then, um, he probably, you know, he just got out of it. He cashed out. Now, what are some of the uh, innovations that are credited to TK Star, your company? What 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 new machines did you come up with at the time that you developed? And, and what year was that? Uh, early '80s. I remember around 1983, I developed the Power Squat. Hmm, oh, that was which, yours. Huh? Which I see everyone makes now. Yeah. And. Um, you you you, you, you did uh, you you invented the uh, the the rotating handles for for working back the um you know the first jungle gym the leg extension machines those were all yours right they're all mine and at the time I I used to have a collection of Vic Tanny equipment that was made in the fifties and that that was the equipment that um, Joe Gold had remember the old pancake weights yeah yeah the flat ones yeah and that stuff was way before its time way before it's time and I used to you know copy that stuff in a way I, used, I mean I did my own copying like everyone else did but I tried to just make it better and more suitable for what what the people were looking for at the time and um, the other thing I got into was little angles you know like the incline benches when Iron Man magazine used to make them it was just a strict 45 degree angle right and I would watch guys like arch their back. So really, 45 was too high. Mm. I mean, 30 degrees was better. Or 30 yeah, I agree. Two, 35 degrees was better. And it's all these little things that mean a lot. You know, even the way you position your hands and little, little, little tweaks that I used to listen. Um, you know, I, I would try to listen to bodybuilders and... You know, I, I always ran into people that had good ideas. They they didn't know how to make anything with their hands, but they they knew what they were getting at. And then you knew how to, and then you translated that into the machines. I would go home and I'd work day and night in my shop all night long, just you know welding, making a lot of mistakes. But you know, I was down in Mount Vernon, which is not right outside the city. Sure, in Westchester. So, yeah, we I had guys. You know, guys would come by all the time, test out stuff. Um, I had one guy. I don't know if you ever heard of this guy. They call him the Crazy Doctor. What was what was his last name? Kaufman. Kaufman. You know Mike Kaufman? Yes, that's Doctor Mike, my uh, <laughs> mentor. Mike. That's right. He's he, you know he, Mike. He died Dr. recently. Mike. No, I yeah, didn't know that. Yeah, he had liver and kidney failure. But yeah, he was he was he was the guy who influenced me. He was one of my. He went to the same medical school I went to. As a matter of fact. Doctor Mike, he was. Well, he was. A, I mean, lived in Scarsdale. Yeah, he I told. I told John he used to have a a, a side lateral machine in his in his living room next to his phone. His whole house. His whole house. I mean, the guy was divorced like six times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. His whole, his whole house was gym equipment. He bought everything from me. Oh, he bought all the stuff from you. That's oh, that's <laughs> oh, funny. Constantly buying. You know, he gave me a lot of ideas. That that guy was a biomechanical bio mechanical genius. I mean, he knew. He knew what equipment should be. He was a yeah, he was a genius. He was a pro he child was a prodigy genius, too. Man. He was emotionally retarded, but he was <laughs> he was absolutely brilliant. Oh my god, he was a, he was a, he was a maniac. I mean, I remember every time I saw him, he remember he used to get hurt a lot. Yes, he, he was, was always down the yeah. stairs. <laughs> <laughs> Taurus. 
<laughs> for every muscle. I'll never get to tell you. This is how much it, people. He was a fanatic, fanatic. He, I, one time he shows up at my shop. He's got stitches in his head. He, sh- he, he shaved his head and he put. He had like about eight stitches. I said, Michael Ham. Because well, after I did legs le- the other night, I did my two-hour leg workout. So then I figured, well, I might as well take my five-mile run. <laughs> so I'm running. I'm running. You know, he's running in Scarsdale. And it was probably at three like, in the morning too. He was probably doing. Yeah, yeah, that. yeah. He, well, he was a stayed up all night. That yeah, guy. And yeah. He goes. I stepped. He goes. I stepped in a a, a crevice in the road, and I cracked my head on a side view mirror. <laughs> so I I only had a quarter mile left. So I finished my run. <laughs> <laughs> I I came home. The kids, oh, daddy, daddy. I said, daddy's okay. Daddy, a little blood. Daddy's okay. So I had I I, I stitched myself. Yeah, I was gonna say he probably did it himself. I, I I stitched myself in the mirror, but you know what? He goes like this to me. You know what, Tom? I'm so freaking pissed off. I said, why? Because the next day I had delts and I had a terrible delt workout because <laughs> I had, I had to hold my. You know, I have to keep remembering that in the mirror it's backwards. <laughs> so, and I'm and I'm looking at like I'm looking at this guy like this. This guy is really this guy's crazy. Yeah, he, he was. <laughs> he actually told me he developed equipment, and, and and I didn't know who he did it for. But I guess he wasn't lying after all. No, he was. Um, oh, this this guy. Um, he knew angles. <laughs> He would show me how to, you know, like how to make my calf machines better, like little things, because that's all he thought about. Yeah, he was obsessed. Out. He was obsessed with working out. Oh, he was very obsessed. I think part of our relationship deteriorated because he, <laughs> he, he was jealous that I had left medical school and became a, a, a very popular bodybuilder, and I think that's ultimately <laughs> what he really wanted to do at, you know, at some point in time. Yeah, he um, <laughs> he was one of a kind. I, I I didn't know he passed away. Just I didn't know either. I had lost touch with him because, like I said, we had had like a falling out because he had. I think he just started resenting that I was what I was doing, and because uh, we had been very close, I used to hang out with him like till three in the morning working out. He had his key to his own gym up in uh, where he lived in Portchester for a while there, <laughs> and you know he would train till all hours of the night, and I would just sit there and, and, and ask him questions. And really, a lot of my uh, philosophies and diet philosophies and just knowledge about drugs and performance and yeah. stuff all came from him because we would just talk about it endlessly for hours, and he loved it. I mean, he was thriving he on it. it. And I tried he to get him to write a book, and I tried to get him to write articles, but he just, he, all he wanted to do was work out, you know, the guy. I know. He was, a, he was a really a good dermatologist, too. He was awesome. He actually treated Wayne D'Amelio, all his, his whole family. And, uh, yeah, he cured, how, like, he, he cured people like no one else could cure. Unbelievable, this guy. I, I, I heard he'd just, like, rip your face apart, and then, like, inject the, like, you know, he would go way over the top. Yes, and he was ambidextrous. And all, and all of a sudden, people's acne is all done. He was ambidextrous. He could actually operate with both hands. The guy. He was. He was incredible. He was a genius. <laughs> How did? When did you? When did? Speaking of uh, innovators and, and people who are famous celebrities, I'm glad you're the first person I met who, who's known Dr. Mike. That's great. Oh, Dr. Mike was the best. Yeah. I met him when I was very young. Very good, nice, really good heart too. The guy had. I met him in uh, New Michelle. Yeah. When he was looking for equipment, he found out I made equipment. He told me and that like, he outfitted he, his whole house, yeah. Yeah, and he tracked me down, and he had all these ideas, and, you know, I'd known him from late 70s. The last He called me, he was living in Virginia. He had gotten, I guess, married again. Yeah, and he, he, he talked to you that recently, huh? He called you that recently, huh? I would say... It had to be in 2000 uh, something, right? In the last 10 years, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, probably yeah around two thousand yes. Yeah. You probably talked to him after I you know I probably hadn't even talked to him then. You probably talked to him last. His son. He was, he was he was the nicest guy too. Yeah, his sons were really smart too because they were like really lazy for a while. They were living with him and then they moved out to California. They got a job on Baywatch and they were like directors right. and producers on the Baywatch. I, I remember him telling me that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I watched his sons grow up. They were, they were kids and they were yeah. always with him. Of course, he was making them train whether they liked it yeah. or not. Yeah, yeah, they hated it. And, you know, then they grew up. 
I think you put the old, the younger one on growth hormone. The kid grew like like <laughs> like, like two feet in like one year. I wouldn't, I wouldn't doubt it. I think he, he put his dog on stuff. Yeah, he's, he's, <laughs> he, he, no, he was an animal though. Did you ever see all the cats? He had, he had like, like 80, Johnny had like eighty cats yeah, in his house. He had like about forty <laughs> cats in his house. He's right. Oh my god, and like eight dogs. When the dogs would come out to go out for a walk, he, it was like a stampede. All, all that I remember is finding his house in Scarsdale and I'd go past all these houses with like manicured lawns. Oh, his was disgusting. And then I would pull up and it looked like, remember the monsters, the monsters yeah. house? <laughs> the, the, grass, the grass was three feet high. That was and him. His, and his sons were like 11 driving his Mercedes, like peeling out. <laughs> And like, and then he would have Credence Clear Water. He like, he liked the '60s music. Yeah. He had like Credence, uh, Credence Clear Water revival. Uh-huh. And, and he'd, he'd be doing like tech tech with like all his might. Yeah, like, the whole screaming. house was covered with the weightlifting equipment. There yeah. was no furniture. I said, okay, I found the house. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, Tom, when, when did you meet Arnold? When was the first time you ran into him? I met Arnold well, the very first time. I like to tell the story was the Whitney Museum when he, you know, they did that exhibition. Right. And I was a kid. I was like star, totally starstruck. You know, Arnold, Arnold. And back then, that that was in February 1976, right? Mm-hmm. So he was finished, like he won the 75 Olympia, which was in South, South Africa, which was like November. Right. Now, back then, I don't know if you remember, but you wouldn't know who won the contest until two or three months later when you'd get Reader's Magazine. Sure, there was no there, way there was, there was no way to know who won. You would have to wait months. And I had only heard that he won it. And that he, I remember hearing that, I don't know how, that he, he trained like only 10 weeks for it. So we got in the elevator, and all of a sudden, he's in it. He's like, oh, I'm on the elevator with Arnold. And uh, I'm like, oh, like, like I was like 16 years old. I'm more so, I'm like, oh no, oh my God, oh no, oh no. I said, oh no, you won, you won the Olympia, you won it again, and you didn't even train much. And he looked at me and he goes, you, you doubted me. <laughs> <laughs> and like the whole, the whole, you know, that's cocky, oh no. The whole elevator was silent. I was like, oh, well, I guess you know. I, I didn't even know what to say, you know. <laughs> so the, the one, the one time you met Arnold, the first time you met Arnold, you felt like uh, he made you feel small, huh? Oh, that's you know him. That's how he was, you know. <laughs> now, but but you, then I met him over the years. He, of course, he has at shows, and again, he knew I. He knew I was close with Joe. With Joe Gold, because I used to go out and sit with Joe. I used to go to the store for Joe. I was like, you know, I did anything for Joe. Especially as he got older, and Arnold kind of knew that, and then Arnold was would always, you know, go out of his way to say hello to me. But you know, Arnold was always busy and sure. people around him, and you you could never really sit with Arnold. Yeah, jo- and Joe you know. Joe was like a father figure to Arnold, wasn't he? Absolutely. Probably yeah, maybe, Joe, maybe even more so than Joe Weider. Oh, I think so. I mean, Joe Weider was a was purely business thing with Arnold. I mean, Joe benefited from Arnold, and Arnold benefited from Joe. It was like that, right? What uh, you know, you 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 were sought out by many of the uh, top bodybuilders of the day, um, you know, to make equipment for them. Who were who some of the other you know top name bodybuilders that uh, you made equipment for back in the day? Back in the day, well, I mean. Lou Ferrigno started his own, um, I don't know what he's doing these days, but I'd say back in the 80s and 90s, he had his own personal training thing going. Right. Um, I mean, you, you know, you know Lou, Louis, how he is. Yeah, no, I know Louis very well. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, they're all characters. And then, uh, I, I remember Ed Corny, I was close with Ed Corny. And Ed Corny wanted to always open. You know, a lot of these guys, they want to open their own gym. But they, I guess they realize later what a gym really is all about. It's a business that you got to work 20 hours a day in. That's why I never and, opened one. I always said it's, it's a lot of work. You know, you're, you're smart. Like, remember Victor Martinez? Yeah. Opened the gym. Yeah, you're right. And it did okay, but 
he's really a world class bodybuilder. Yeah. He, he, he's not going to sit in a gym 12 hours a day. No way. No. So, but, um, I, I don't know. Not, I can't say I made, I mean, I worked with a lot of bodybuilders. Like, uh, I met many times uh, Larry Scott. And we used to talk about the old Vince, Vince Gironda equipment. And the preacher curls and the trice. I, I actually have original sketches from Larry Scott. Oh wow! That him and Vince. Yeah, I don't know where they are. I have them somewhere. You know, just the angles and how Larry. Of course, he loved doing arms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course, he did anything. Scott. Anything for arms. Yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> what are, so, uh, go ahead. You know, you told me a great story about how when you first met Casey Viador. Yeah. Well, Casey was one of my favorite bodybuilders because, you know, I always knew how, I read about how strong he was. Like, he used to incline 505, 10 times. Wow. He was and he was the real deal. He was, yeah, he, but he looked strong, but he really was strong. He was a good Louisiana boy. Yeah. And uh, we were out... I used to go on all of these shows that maybe Wayne put on. Wayne, you know, I used to tag along. And uh, I was eating breakfast at one of the buffets that they had. I, it, it was one of the shows, I think, in Las Vegas. That, and, it was, and, and Casey was dating one of the women competitors. But anyway, I just woke up, and I'm eating my breakfast. And from the corner of my eye, I see like a gigantic piece of flesh that was tanned you know, go by me. So I said, well, I must be a bodybuilder, and that must have been his thigh. <laughs> so I look over, and it's Casey Vieira, and, and that flesh I saw, that was his forearm. Holy <laughs> crap. <laughs> I mean, this guy was jacked. I mean, back back then, like, Casey used to dress like the 1970s style. He used to wear, like, double-knit pants. <laughs> and do you, remember, do you remember those Terry Cloth, those Terry Cloth, shirts people wore. Yeah. The big baggy ones. He, they were thick though. Yeah. And this guy, his bicep vein was sticking right out of it like it was nothing. <laughs> and I was like, wow, this guy. Those are like 1982. Yeah. I mean, that. I mean, that's when, I guess that, he was in, well, they say he really won that show in London against Chris Dickerson, but I don't know. There was, that was controversy who won that. Mm hmm I guess I guess Chris won it, but a lot of people thought Casey could have won it. You know how it is. Some of them shows are close. Well, you know, I have a question for you because Joe Gold at some point sold Gold's Gym, and at some point he opened World Gym. I mean, you were close with Joe. What motivated him to all of a sudden get back into the gym business? Um. Well, he was a seaman. He used to go out on a boat. And he used to, like, uh, ship cargo all around. He was, was like a sailor. He was a marine merchant. Merchant marine, oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, way, way back, like 19... I mean, Joe Gold, for the time everyone knew him, no one ever knew how old he was. You know? <laughs> how old they was always, he? I, I guess he died in his 80s, his mid-80s or mid to late 80s. Yeah. yeah. He was a lot older than you thought because he was always 10. But um, uh, he sold, he sold, well, I think because the, the industry started growing and he had some partners like the guy Mike, Mike Urak. Oh, he was one of his partners? Yeah. And then I heard that Arnold really, well, I don't know. They said Arnold, you know, put up a lot of money to get him started again. I mean, Arnold took care of him. Mm-hmm. And then Arnold owned a lot of real estate also out there that he had bought in like Santa Monica. Sure. So I guess one thing led to another and then Joe Gold saw how Gold's gym got really big. And I guess he just wanted back in, in on it. And then, you know, World Gym was very successful. Was, was Joe Gold a rich man too? Was he, was he a very wealthy individual? I mean, it seems like he should have been from Gold and World. He had no, they, they took very good care of him. Between Arnold and Mike, uh, he had you know he had people that really took it, you know anything he wanted. 
Oh, okay. He wasn't like a real materialistic guy. Right. Yeah. That needed a lot of fancy stuff, but, um, you know, he had a nice house. Yeah, he had everything, you know. You, you, he, you, it, was, it was comfortable. He, he, he sold Gold's Gym to Ken Sprague for $7,000. That's it? Oh. Oh my God! Yeah. Wow, I didn't know that. Wow. Seven thousand, so or seven or seventy five hundred, and I think it last sold for one hundred and sixty million. Wow! <laughs> what about World Gym? Uh, it was name recognition, you know. Yeah, it's what? what they call today branding. Right, branding. What happened with World Gym? Did he ever sell that? Didn't he sell that at one time? I think he sold it to um, Planet Fitness. Planet Fitness, right? Yeah, but that was after he died, or yeah, that it? was after he died, though. Who who took I over think- that after him? That guy, Mike. Mike. Mike was like his lawyer. Oh, Mike Uritz. Yeah. Yeah. Mike Uritz changed the uh, the Santa Monica gym location on Second Street. Turned that into his office. Is that right? Yeah. Hmm. Didn't even know. That. Wow. Yeah. But those guys were good to me. I mean, they used to recommend they used to recommend my equipment to all their world gyms. I mean, I shipped stuff like all over the world because of those guys. Do you still own TK Star? What's going on with the company now? Well, right now I have a full I have a full service business. I do I go to all the gyms. I do reupholstery. I fix all the equipment. I am a selective type of clientele. Mm-hmm. And I kind of say that it's like Henry Ford coming out to fix your car. <laughs> 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 you no, know, you can't beat it. No, did well? Did you sell TK Star at one point? No, no. I just got what happened with me in the early. I got really sick. I got really ill. I got like poisoned. I lost one of my kidneys. I mean, I had to stop. Mm. What and year was, was that? Just, um, about 1992. Oh, wow. So I took a break. But at that time, the whole industry changed. I mean, everything really started going to China and Taiwan. And then some companies just got bought up by each other. The bigger companies, like, you know, brought out who they could. And uh, it just became a mass marketing. I mean, now you got, like, Life Fitness. <clears throat> they make a, you know, they make a good product. They finance it for you. They deliver it in 30 days. It, it, it's just a different industry now. There's really... As far as, I mean, I got back into it in the mid-90s, kind of like as an artist. Because, you see, my thing, I never, especially when I was younger, I was never really a businessman. I I just wanted to make equipment. I just wanted to create. I, I loved being around the bodybuilding world, you know, the powerlifting world, just being able to make machines that make these guys happy. You know, I mean, that was my motivation. It was never to make a lot of money. It was never, you know... To, to grow a big business. I mean, like, looking back, I could have. I've had a lot of people want to be my partner and all that, but, you know, I was never in it for that. But, you know, you, you made mention of stuff being made in Taiwan and China, and, and uh, you know, I know I noticed a lot of the, um, almost all of the big cardio companies have bought up the weight, the, uh, the weight equipment companies. Yep, that's and, right. And I, I think it was pre-core, um, Actually, buys their their steel in the United States, yep. ships it to China. Yep. Uh, they build the equipment in China, and then they ship the equipment back to the United States. And they can do it cheaper that way than to have it made here. How the hell do they do that? <clears throat> well, in America, you got you know unions where people just walking in the door want thirty, forty dollars an hour. So hopefully, they'll work that day if they feel like it. <laughs> Then you got China, and I've been there. I've been to the South Southeast Asia. I've seen these factories. They, you got these big factories with five hundred guys outside waiting for a work just for the day. Oh my God! Oh, so they got cheap labor over there. And, huh? I, and I'm not kidding when I say that. And you got guys in there on their hands and knees cutting steel with a hacksaw. Wow. <laughs> Just like taking turns, like one guy gets tired, the other guy takes the hat off. And they make, I've been to the Philippines, they have so much labor for next to nothing. Slave labor. That, yeah. yeah. Bag of it's rice. Like slave labor, but it's the only job there. Sure. And they'll work, work, work. They'll, they'll be happy if they just work. 
Right. No one wants to work here in the United States like that. No, it's a, it's a it's a whole different thing, and they're able to produce products, and their technology's gotten better now. I mean, now now the product, even free motion. You heard of free motion? Sure. The cables. It, that yeah, the beautiful that the quality that that's all made in uh, Taiwan. Didn't even wow. know that. And the quality looks beautiful. Wow. Then the next time you see it, look, it says assembled in the USA. It's only assembled here. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. What about the what, but, what's the what's the company the guy we're friends with, John? Uh, John. Ne- Nebula. Nebula is made here. I know. In the yeah. United States, yeah. What do you think of that line of equipment? Beautiful. I love it. It's got a great. You know, that's the kind of equipment I like to make. Yeah, I know you do. Yeah. Real heavy duty, like make it overbuilt like a tank. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, you know, but it's hard to do that now because sure. it's expensive. The, the price of steel and the price of labor, it, it, and then at the same time, the market spoiled where you got like pre core, right? They'll make a deal with you if you, if you buy all their ellipticals and all their treadmills. They'll they'll give you the strength the strength equip they call it strength equipment now they'll they'll give it to you for half price. The, really? Is yeah, that yeah. The case? I mean, you know, they'll make a deal where you can't say no. So a gym owner, you know, he takes the deal. So, I mean, they they would like to have an inverted leg press from me or Nebula, but but no one really cares anymore. Yeah, it's all about it's all about business. So are these are these small mom and pop businesses that are popping up? Are they just never going to make it? Is it impossible in this marketplace, given the way I, the, the 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 what's going on? I I, I don't want to sound negative. Um, the only thing I would say is I I I wouldn't. You know what I'm doing today, which is the service end, which I've always done. You sure. I I wish I did this ten years ago. You making more money doing this? Yeah, I'm making I'm, I'm making a good living. I got happy customers. I'm in and out in one day. But I love, believe me, I have a passion to make a gym equipment like like no like no one else. But but I me I I wouldn't want to go in that business today. Wow. I wouldn't go in it. What, what do you just, uh, what, what, do you see the future? I mean, is, do you think there's a future for you know good, strong American-made gym equipment that's going to last a lifetime, or is it just going to be this disposable stuff that we're getting from Asia? I think if a guy like say ne- Nebula, if a guy could set up a shop and keep his expenses down, and just you know, this is what I would. I, I mean, I would make five good products. I wouldn't try to make thirty, forty. I wouldn't try to compete. Right. With anyone. I would make about five real good pieces at a good price and make them real basic. Like, um, you know, nothing fancy. But just a good basic at a good price that, um, and just and just sell them to, you know, guys like Steve Weinberger. Right. In uh, Long Island. You know, good Spec- hardcore specialty gym. Specialty pieces oh, you're talking about. You wouldn't try to outfit the whole gym. You're going to give them specialty pieces where they'll buy one from you or buy two from you, that kind of thing. Right. And you're the only guy making those pieces. Right. That's a good right, idea. Right. That, that Maybe that's what the guy from Nebula should concentrate on. That That's what I would do if I was him. And, um, you know, I just kind of like did it twice. And it, it takes a lot out of you. I mean, it, for me, it took, it took everything I had. Mm. And, you know, you just get tired. You get at some point tired of it when you really need a break so you're not you're not going to come out with any new equipment lines anytime soon is that is that what you're saying i myself i i uh, i'm not in the mood to set up a shop i mean for 25 years i had you know i had good polish welders from poland Mm -hmm. that i had a good polish connection and they used to help bring in these guys and you know now those guys work you know and those guys work like eastern Bloc europeans yeah. So I, I had good guys like that, but all those guys, I, there's, there's not the workforce is not there. Right. Yeah, you're right. You got to have the workforce. So you can't do it. Yeah, and you end up doing everything yourself, and you get burnt out. Yeah. Tom, how old are you? I'm fifty. Tom's oh, young. Yeah. He's your age. Yeah, he's my age. <laughs> yeah, I started young. I was yeah, very you did. young. Very young. Yeah. Wow. Well, Tom, you know, I appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule and, and talking to us, and you got to keep us updated. If you ever do decide to come out with a new uh, equipment line, you got to let us know and uh, update us. I think us. about it all the time, and the other night, I was in the gym working out legs, and, you know, they had a power squat machine there, and all I could say is, I'm standing there, and i got to wait online 
like everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> it was your machine, too, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'm, look, I'm looking at these kids, and they're looking at me like, you know, what am I looking at? You know. <laughs> Did you tell them that it was yours? Parents. Did you tell them you designed yeah. it? No, I just keep it to myself. Uh, yeah. You're a very low key guy. Better that way. But you know, yeah, I, I I love what you guys are doing. I really appreciate it. Thank you for uh, talking to us. That was uh, very enlightening. And, yeah. Uh, like I said, if you if you decide to start doing anything new, you gotta you gotta update us and let us know. Okay. All I right. Definitely will. Tom Kinney, Bye. inventor of TK Star, one of the pioneers in uh, exercise equipment in this country. Thanks, man. Thanks, Tom. I'll see you guys. Thank you.